Hello there, how you doing? Um, it's horrible wet and rainy outside. So I'm sitting here and I decided to tell you another story from my childhood. This is called The Great Escape. Instinctively, I did not take to the woman. There was no kindly greeting, no reassuring smile, just a quick glance sizing me up. Then the ingratiatingly false niceness directed towards my welfare officer. That's what they used to call her, social workers in those days, welfare officers. The year was 1960. At 13 years old, I was a seasoned old pro where foster parents were concerned. There had been several in my life. I'd only been here two minutes and already I had the measure of this one. I did not like her sullen, hard face or her severe short hair. I did not like how tidy she looked and I did not like how clean and scrubbed the house was. It did not bode well. The situation I found myself in was, as usual, all of my own doing. Another bust up with mum and a new husband, Jimmy. Their constant arguing left me worried and anxious. I didn't know how to deal with it other than running away and living rough. At night I'd sleep in haylofts and barns and then eventually, cold and dirty and hungry, I would make my wealth way to the welfare offices and seek out my caseworker. She would then accompany me to the corporation bathhouse for a scrub up and a change into clean clothes. I remember the bathhouse fondly. After the welfare officer had left, I was shown up to my room. I say my room, but it was in fact more of a small dormitory. There were four beds crammed into it three singles and one double. She went to a large tall boy and pulled open a drawer. This will be your drawer. Put your things in here and keep it tidy, she instructed. My things amounted to one change of clothes in a brown paper carrier bag. The drawer would be plenty big enough. You will be sleeping in the big bed, she said. That was all right. I like plenty of room. She went through the house rules with me. There were a lot of them, but I stopped listening after the first couple. I had been institutionalised from a baby. I knew all the rules. I had heard them, or variations of them, many, many, many times. That night, I was awoken by someone climbing into bed beside me. What the? I moved over to the furthest edge against the wall and froze. It was pitch dark and I was disorientated. Where was the door? How could I escape this person? Was it one of the other boys? The intruder did not touch me or attempt to touch me. He just lay there. After a while, the bed began to shake. Oh my God, didn't he know I was there? He was masturbating right beside me. Get, it. Get me out of here. Just as I had decided that my only course of action was to leap out of bed shouting for help, he finished what he was doing with a loud groan. Dirty bastard. I hope he goes blind. I'd always been warned that masturbation called blindness. That would serve him right. Soon he began to snore. I relaxed a little, but kept myself as close to the wall as I could. I slept in fits and starts, waking often whenever he made the slightest movement. In the early light of dawn, I stole a look at my unexpected bedfellow. He was a young, spotty-faced man in his mid-twenties. Spots, you see, they were another symptom of his dirty habit. It suddenly occurred to me that the reason for the double bed was because I would be sharing with someone else. But my welfare officer wasn't told that. The house was silent apart from the sounds emanating from those asleep in the room. I slowly worked my way to the end of the bed and climbed over the end board, being careful not to disturb anyone. 
In the half light I dressed as quietly as I could, retrieved my carrier bag from the drawer and carrying my boots crept out of the room and down the stairs. Before putting my boots on I searched the kitchen cupboards for food and helped myself to half a loaf of bread which joined my other stuff in the carrier bag. Then, boots on, I let myself out, closing the front door ever so gently behind me. I had decided to hitchhike to London. Quite a journey for a small lad of 13 years old. Over 700 miles, but I thought it would be an adventure. I had two half crowns in my pocket. Five shillings. That ought to keep me going for a while. That and the half loaf. It looked like being a nice day. The journey started with my favourite way of travelling. I began running and didn't stop until I, co I reached the outskirts of Aberdeen and the main road out of town. I was heading south. There was no shortage of vehicles heading south out of Aberdeen this early morning. A lorry stopped for me almost as soon as I stuck my thumb out. I'm heading for Glasgow, he said as I clambered in. Any good for you? Yes, thanks. I'm going to London. Well, Glasgow will give you a good start then, he said, slamming it into gear and pulling out into the traffic. For the next ten minutes or so, he never stopped talking, asking me questions. Where did I come from? Where was I going to stay in London? How old was I? Where did I work? I answered as well as I could, lying through my teeth. It was a mistake to tell him I was 18, though. People even found it difficult to believe I was 13. I was so small for my age. He glanced across at me. He was trying to keep it conversational, but it was obvious I was being interrogated, and I began to feel uneasy. After about 20 miles or so, we reached the coastal town of Stonehaven. He said he had to get cigarettes. We stopped outside the newsagent and tobacconist shop. He was in there too long for my liking. It was easy for me to imagine him asking the shopkeeper to call the police. Easy to imagine that he had seen through my hasty, ill thought out lies. I was not prepared to wait around to find out, so jumping from the cab, I took to my heels and ran quickly down the nearest side street. Soon I found myself beside the sea and took shelter in a beach hut on the promenade. It was not long before I heard the urgent, strident sound of an approaching police car's bell. I presumed, rightly or wrongly, that my assumptions about the lorry driver were right and I stretched out on the bench, chewing chunks of bread from my half loaf while I waited for the danger of being apprehended to pass. The police car made a couple of turns along the seafront, but they obviously had more important matters to attend to than a young runaway, and soon, much to my relief, they disappeared. It was about two o'clock the next morning when several private cars, a van and a lorry later, I was dropped off in Hammersmith, London. Not bad going. And due to the generosity of those drivers, I had also been fed in transport cafes and still had four shillings and sixpence in my pocket. The problem I had now was that I had nowhere to stay. I hadn't thought this through, beyond reaching London. I decided that in the morning I would phone Aunt Jo, my mum's sister, and ask her for help. Well now though, I sat myself in a shop doorway and tried despite the cold night air, to sleep. The creepy bloke had passed by me several times, slowing down and giving me the once over each time. I knew it was the same man because he was wearing a bright blue oversized jacket which looked to me very out of place. Finally, and as I expected, he stopped and looked down at me. He was small and thin bald-headed, with little staring eyes. He looked unkempt, unwashed and unshaven. On his feet he had dirty torn plimsolls. He smelled strongly of stale beer. Ain't you got nowhere to stay? 
he asked, smiling through black teeth. I was nervous and wary. I'm waiting for someone, I said. He wandered off, but was soon back. I live just down the road, he said. You can stay with me tonight, if you need a bed. No thanks, I said. He was a bit persistent. Come on, it's all right. No thanks. I stood up, clutching my carrier bag, getting ready to run, but he was blocking the doorway. As I tried to push past him, he grabbed my arm. Come on, you're coming with me. No, I'm fucking not, I shouted, and stamped my boot down hard on his foot. He released his grip. I shot past him and ran like a bat out of hell. In the morning, I found a workman's cafe and bought two bacon rolls and a cup of tea. Delicious. I sat there for a while enjoying the warmth and I must have dozed off. The next thing was the lady waking me. Are you okay, dear? It seemed nice. I had another cup of tea before leaving to phone Aunt Jo. I soon found her number in the directory and fed four pennies into the coin slot. Hello? I pressed the button A and heard the coins fall. Hello, Auntie Jo, it's John. John? Who's John? It's me, John, Muriel's boy. What do you want, she said. I'm in London, Auntie. I need somewhere to stay. There was a click and we were cut off. I pressed button B to get my money back. Nothing. I dialed again. Another four pennies. Button A. Yes. Hello, Auntie Jo. Don't call here again. She hung up. Button B again. No such luck. Eightpence wasted. What had I ever done to have such a useless family? Later that day, I was back in the cafe. The lady was really nice and friendly. I asked her if I could come and work for her. She said she would have to phone the owner to see what he thought about it. In the meantime, she gave me a cup of tea and a cheese sandwich, and she wouldn't take any money for it. I was grateful and a little bit tearful, I must admit, at her kindness. I'd almost finished the sandwich when the two policemen walked in. One stood by the door while the other pulled out a chair and sat down beside me. Hello, it's John, isn't it? Everyone has been looking for you, he said. It's time to go back now, son. The cafe lady came over. Sorry, darling, she said, and handed me a bar of chocolate. I couldn't be angry with her. She was too nice. Anyway, by this time, I was quite pleased to be found. It turned out that most of the people who gave me lifts had also reported me to the police as a runaway. I suppose their concern was not surprising. Most of the decent people would do the same when they consider a child to be at risk. Somehow, though, I'd always managed to stay one jump ahead of them. After a stern lecture delivered by an angry sergeant at the police station, I was handed over to the care of my former welfare officer from the London County Council. When I had given my word not to run off again, I was taken back to Scotland by train in the charge of yet another welfare officer. This one was young and pretty. By the end of the journey, I'd fallen in love with her, and it was sad to say goodbye when she finally handed me back into the care of Aberdeen Welfare Office. I was put into a children's home in Aboyne, a small village in the heart of Aberdeenshire, just a mile or so down the road from Her Majesty the Queen's place at Balmoral Castle. It wasn't too bad. I had my own bed.
been whittling on this stick for um well i found this stick about 10 years ago and uh, i do a little bit every now and again um the beauty of this stick is that i i was attracted to it because of this it was all um honeysuckle or woodbine all around it that made it that lovely shape it's um a little bit of hazel and uh i decided just to do a bit of whittling tonight it's raining out and uh it's bloody boring actually isn't it the rain i bet you're not allowed to whittle in your in your sitting room <laughs> well not if you've got a wife to worry about but I don't have anything like, like that. I guess went on to that floor. Now I hope you enjoyed the little story that I told. Uh, thanks for looking in. Oh, can you see the stick in its entirety? I put a um, an old half penny in there. Good strong stout stick. Thanks for looking in. I hope you're keeping well. See you soon. Bye bye.